welcome each of you to this video where we are commemorating the seven last sayings of Jesus Christ on Good Friday, April the 10th, 2020. This is Pastor Maurice Lawson. I want to invite you to open your Bibles or get to the Word of God somewhere, however you get there. If you've got a device, a smart device that you open up an app and, and get there on, please go there now as we jump right into these seven last sayings. Luke, the 23rd chapter, verses 33 and 34 is where we will begin as we lift up this first word of Jesus Christ on the cross. And it reads, and when they had come to the place called Calvary, there they crucified him and the criminals, one on the right hand and the other on the left. Then Jesus said, here's the word right here, here's the saying, Father, forgive them for they do not know what they do. And they divided his garments and cast lots. I want you to take a moment as you think about that first word, Father, forgive them for they know not what they do. And I want you to try to see if you can picture this scene, this scene of Jesus hanging on the cross between two criminals. And not only that, below him is a whole bunch of activity going on. Not good activity, not for the Lord, it's negative activity. There are people down there hurling insults at Jesus. The Roman soldiers, have tortured him and are torturing him. They're dividing his clothes, humili humiliating him as he is on the cross, stretched out, naked, bruised, and dying. And in the midst of his dying, and in the midst of these insults coming from the religious leaders, coming from just passers-by, coming from soldiers, Jesus looks up to God and in a prayer, he says, Father, forgive them for they know not what they do. Now, I just um, annotated a number of individuals or groups who Jesus was talking about when he said, forgive them. The soldiers, the Pharisees, the Roman government, and even just regular passersby that was standing there hurling accusations at him. But what I did not discuss and what may not be obvious is the them that Jesus talked about when he said, Father, forgive them for they know not what they do. That included you and I. That included the Marys. That included the Wandas, the Bettys, the Johns, or whatever your name might be. Even though we weren't present and we were thousands of years from being on this earth, Jesus included us in the them. You know why that's so? That's so because his death, burial, and resurrection, it transcended time. And it transcends time. The effects of it transcends time. Thank God that not only does it go forward or did it go forward from where he was, but it was so powerful. It was so majestic. It was so wonderful that it even reached back before the day of crucifixion. Do you know that? The Bible tells us that God went down during that time into the holding place where the saints were and he preached deliverance to them and gave them an opportunity to be connected to God the Father through his sacrificial death. Oh, what a blessing and oh, what a picture of God we see here in these words when Jesus stops and prays for the world and says, Father, forgive them for they know not what they do. I surely truly understand what David meant when he said, surely God's goodness and mercy shall follow me. It follows us all the days of our life. And because of his mercy, you and I will be able to dwell in the house of the Lord. That's heaven forever one day. You ought to say praise God for that. As we move on to the second word, I want you to turn in your Bibles or you're in the 23rd chapter of Luke. Just move on down to the 39th verse. I'm going to read the 39th verse to the 43rd verse. And it says, then one of the criminals who were hanged blasphemed him. One of them who were hanging beside Jesus. He said this, if you are the Christ, save yourself and save us. But the other criminal answered, rebuking him, saying, Do you not even fear God, seeing you are under the same condemnation? And we indeed justly, for we receive the due rewards of our deeds. He's saying, man, why are you talking to God like that? You're on the cross because you deserve to be up here. We're criminals. We deserve to be up here. You don't even fear God. He doesn't deserve to be here. So let's go on. And he said, but this man has done nothing. This is what this one criminal said. He's done nothing wrong. Then he said to Jesus, Lord, remember me when you come into your kingdom. And Jesus said to him, assuredly, I say to you, today you will be with me in paradise. That's word number two. Assuredly, I say to you, today you will be with me 
in paradise. I want to ask you to consider something. Have you ever considered the fact that it was not by chance that Jesus is being crucified between two criminals? I'm going to ask you that question again. Do you think it was a mistake that Jesus was being crucified by between two criminals? Was it by happenstance? The answer is no. You need to understand something. God is in control of these events, even though it seemed like it was a very negative outcome for Jesus. God determined all of this, including those where Jesus would die, who he would die with long beforehand. You say, how do you know that? Because I know what scripture says. I know what the prophecy says in Isaiah, the 53rd chapter. It tells us that Jesus was numbered among the transgressors. It was prophesying that Jesus was going to be put up on the cross like a common criminal among other transgressors. So we know that God picked the circumstance in which Jesus would be crucified. So, so what does that mean? That means that as Jesus was in life, so he was in death. Let me unpack that some more. Let me explain it. That means that Jesus, his mission, as he even stated, was I came to seek and to save those who were lost. And you'll notice as you follow Jesus through the gospel, he always found himself with sinners. In fact, one of the 12 disciples, one of his closest associates was a sinner. Matthew, who wrote the first gospel, was a tax collector, a publican. They were considered one of the worst sinners of all people. And Matthew was one of his first selections as one of his disciples. You'll also remember other stories in the Bible where Jesus with the woman at the well in Samaria, the Samaritan woman, Jesus was there with her, knowing the fact that she had been married five times. And that wasn't necessarily the issue that was blown up, but the issue that was really could consider her or categorize her as a sinner. She was currently living with a man and being with a man that she was not married to. Yet Jesus found himself there with her. Do you all remember Zacchaeus? Zacchaeus was another tax collector and sinner whom the Pharisees derided Jesus over spending time at his house eating with him. But Jesus always found himself with sinners. Why is this? Because God loves the sinner. In fact, we were sinners. The Bible says in Romans 3 and 23, it says that all of us have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. None of us came into this world sinless. We all came into the world as sinners. And so we see as Jesus is on the cross, placed between two sinners, you see one sinner reaching out to God as he is died. He spent his whole life being a criminal, being a notorious sinner. And when he calls on the name of the Lord, Jesus stops dying and says to him, Assuredly, I say to you, today you will be with me in paradise. Amen. So I want to tell you something else. This scene also depicts the two responses that people can have to Jesus. Jesus is always willing to save us. He's always willing to show mercy to us and to connect us back to the Father. But we can be like the one thief, reject him, show our disbelief disrespect him, or we can look at ourselves and say, Lord, I'm a sinner, but Lord, I'm calling on your name. And the word says, whoever calls upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. Praise God for this second saying and this showing of the mercy of God and of the goodness of God and saying today, when you confess me, you are now with me in paradise. Let's move on to word number three. Will you turn with me to John the 19th chapter Verses 25 through 27 is what we'll read. And it reads, Now there stood by the cross of Jesus his mother and his mother's sister Mary, the wife of Clopas, and Mary Magdalene. When Jesus therefore saw his mother and the disciple whom he loved standing by, he said to his mother, Woman, behold your son. Then he said to the disciple, Behold your mother. And from that hour that disciple took her into his own home. What a powerful saying. What a powerful statement. I don't know if it's fully understood by many people when they read it, what it meant. It wasn't always fully understood by me, but as I dove into this, I came across a very interesting concept. And it's not my own. I got to give credit where credit is due. There's a writer by the name of Adam Hamilton who wrote about the last words of Christ. He said something very interesting that I'd like for us to consider. He said that Mary was the most important human being 
with the exception of Jesus Christ, to God's salvific plan. Mary was the most important human being. I preached this last year at a Seven Last Saints prophetic conference, and I talked about how Jesus saw Mary as his most precious human possession. But Adam Hamilton went a little further by saying that she was the most important person to God in his salvific plan. Why did he say that? And why does it make sense? And why am I bringing this up? I'm bringing it up because they call Mary, some theologians, the God bearer. Without Mary being a vessel or being willing to say, Lord, be it unto me according to your will. When the angel came to her and said, you're going to bear a son. He basically said, I'm about to throw your life into shambles in some senses. You may lose your husband by becoming pregnant um, without being married. Your life may have been going in a, a certain direction. You may have dreams for yourself, but I want you to stop and I want you to give your life over to me so that you can not only bear and bring into the world the son of God, but you're also going to nurture him and you're going to be standing by his side and enduring the pain. And in a sense, Mary was crucified with Jesus as she stands there at the foot of the cross and she's looking up, crying in pain, trying to console her son. She gave up much of her life to bring Jesus Christ into the world. So Jesus stops dying, looks at his most faithful disciple. And I might add to this, there were three women at the foot of the cross and one male. All of his disciples were dispersed from him. They were scattered in fear of their life. John was there, Mary, Jesus's mother, Mary, the sister-in-law of, of Jesus's mother, and Mary Magdalene was there at the cross all women of God and one man. And Jesus stopped. And I think he was also highlighting, he was highlighting the importance of, I believe it is, the fourth commandment, which says, honor your mother and father that your days may be long upon the earth. Jesus was lifting this up, but he was also proving to us that faithfulness gets rewarded. He handed his most prized possession to his faithful disciple, John. Everybody else had forsaken him, but John was with Jesus the whole time. And Jesus said, John, I can trust you. You're a person I can trust. Now take this woman who is so special to God, my father, and to me, and you take care of her. Can I trust you with that? I want to say this to you as, as, as we move on. I had to evaluate myself, and I want, to, want you to evaluate yourself. Can God trust you with his precious goodness? with the good things that God wants to put into your life, can he trust you from your faithfulness? It's something to think about, something to pray about, to ask God, Lord, help me to be faithful where you can trust me. Praise God. Come on, let's move on to the fourth saying. That fourth saying is found in Mark, the 15th chapter, verse 34 and 35. Are you there? If you are, let's read it. And it says, at the ninth hour, Jesus cried out with a loud voice saying, Eli, Eli, Lama Sabatina. It's a difficult reading right there. He yelled that out in Aramaic, I believe it was, which is translated, My God, my God, why have you forsaken me? Some of those who stood by when they heard that they said, Look, he is calling for Elijah. Now, this, my brothers and sisters, this fourth word, My God, my God, why have you forsaken me? It is a word that is not always completely understood by those who read it. But let me help unpack this a little bit. Jesus cries out, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? This is one of the low points of Jesus's time on earth. He felt, believe this or not, abandoned by his father. And you might say, well, man, that's not good. The Bible tells us that Jesus and God were never separated from one another. Why is this something that would be left by Jesus as a word that we would lift up? Amen. But it's always a deeper point when you look at scripture. First and foremost, Jesus is our high priest. And the Bible tells us that Jesus is not a high priest that cannot be touched with our infirmities. That means that everything that we have dealt with, every pain or emotion, negative and good that we could ever feel, Jesus has felt it. He's endured it. He's endured hunger. He's endured pain. He's endured ridicule. And also, he's endured a feeling that he has been abandoned by God. Have you ever felt like that? Have you ever felt like you're praying and your prayers are just falling on the ground? Have you ever felt like you were in trouble and God is just nowhere to be found? Well, this is how Jesus 
felt right now. And you say, why is this good news? This is good news because it makes Jesus the perfect intercessor. It makes him very credible as someone that you can look to and say, Jesus, tell God that I can't feel him right now. I don't know where he is. And Jesus can empathize with you. Sometimes people can sympathize with you, but they can't empathize with you. There's a difference. Sympathy means that they come in and they come alongside you and they try to help you help understand where you are. But a person who empathizes with you, they don't have to try to understand. They know because they've been in that place. So Jesus can intercede to the Father with empathy for us when we feel neglected by God. This is a wonderful, wonderful saying that God leaves for us through Jesus Christ by letting us know. Jesus is telling us, I know how you feel when you say, God, where are you? It's dark. Doesn't seem like you're anywhere around. Jesus said, I got you, my sister. I have you, John. I got you, James. I got you, Sarah. I know how you feel. I've been there. But let me tell you, God will never leave you nor forsake you. And that's what that fourth word means when Jesus said, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? Can I tell you one other thing? This is a little nugget that I'm going to drop in there. This is actually a psalm. This is the first verse of Psalm 22. So Jesus is actually returning God's word to him in a prayer. Just like the first word, this fourth word is a prayer, a cry out to God. But you know, I found this out. Sometimes when you don't know what to pray, when you don't have words in a situation, when the pain is so great, when the circumstance is so overwhelming and you don't know what to say to God, you can open up a psalm and begin to pray that psalm back to God. And that's what Jesus did here. So he's not only showing us that he is a credible high priest, but he's also showing us how to pray to God when we feel abandoned. How wonderful is this? Somebody ought to say amen. Somebody ought to clap their hands and shout glory. Amen. Come on, let's move to the fifth word, which is found in John, the 19th chapter and the 28th verse. It's just one verse. It's another very interesting saying. And it reads, after this, Jesus, knowing that all things were now accomplished, that the scripture might be fulfilled, he said two words, I thirst, I thirst. This is very interesting. And I love this. And I thank God that I recently received some good insight on this. And I've been preaching about this for the last several weeks when Jesus often talked about living water. He would always say, I'm the living water. And water in the scripture represents life. So Jesus stopped dying to say, I thirst. And no doubt he was physically thirsty because as I understand it, one of the cravings or one of the urges that people experience as they are getting ready to transition from this life is thirst. They become thirsty. And so Jesus no doubt was thirsty, but I think there's a deeper meaning to this statement. Notice this. Notice that Jesus constantly talked about water. Go back with me again to the Samaritan woman where Jesus went to the well and asked the woman for a drink. And as she was talking to him and as she was preparing to give Jesus a drink, Jesus stopped and looked at her in the fourth chapter of John and around the 24th verse. And he says, if you knew the gift of God and who it was that said unto you to give me a drink, you would ask him and he would give you living water. That's it, alluding to thirst. He's talking about thirst. In one of the greatest sermons known to man that Jesus ever preached in the Sermon on the Mount, Jesus said this. He said, he that hunger and thirsts after righteousness shall be filled. Also, a few chapters back in John, the seventh chapter, Jesus, in the middle of a Passover feast, he stands up in Jerusalem and he says, if anyone is thirsty, let him come to me and let him drink. So when Jesus talks about thirst here, not only is Jesus looking to quench his thirst, his natural thirst, but more importantly, I believe Jesus was telling us to have and to seek righteous thirst. I believe Jesus was also saying, I'm so thirsty to complete this mission. I'm thirsty to reunite with my father. But I want to tell my people that they have to have a thirst for me because I am the living water boy. <laughs> That's good right there. You know what? And if you're at this moment feeling like, man, I don't know if my thirst 
is the right kind of thirst because we can be thirsty for a whole lot of things. In fact, that's a colloquialism in our in our vernacular today, in our society or in our culture. We often say she's thirsty, man, or he's thirsty, representing that they have a negative motive or a a bad, uh, you know, uh, motivation for trying to get something that they should not have or get something in the wrong way. But I want you to think about this. What are your true thirsts? And if your thirst, if you know, like me, some of your thirsts are not in keeping with what God would want for you, you should pray a prayer something like this. God, give me righteous thirst. Give me a thirst that I thirst after you, those good things. Say amen, trust God to do it, and then put a praise on it. Hallelujah. Let's move on to the sixth word. The sixth word, I love this one, is found in John, the 19th chapter, the same chapter. One verse below, it begins in the 29th verse, and it's the 29th and the 30th verse. And it reads, now a vessel full of sour wine was sitting there and they filled the sponge with sour wine, put it on hyssop and put it to his mouth. So when Jesus had received the sour wine, he said, it is finished. And bowing his head, he gave up his spirit. This sixth word is pretty much, it is finished. Three words, a phrase. The interesting thing about this is that some theologians say that this is actually not a phrase. Jesus spoke this phrase or word be it in Aramaic. But since the New Testament is written in Greek, the original text has it translated in Greek as one word, meaning finish. So in essence, what we've been told by some theologians is that Jesus didn't say it is finished. Jesus actually said finished or completed. So What's important about this? Why are we bringing up this point? Because some people, when they hear it is finished, they get the connotation that Jesus is in defeat, giving up and saying, okay, it's time for me to die. But there's a different picture, a different point that we want to lift up right here. If Jesus, in essence, was actually saying finished, it reminds me of my time competing as a basketball player. And if I can take you back to the court, I'm not talking about organized basketball. I'm talking about when we would be on the playground playing. And on the playground, we like to talk trash. And we got little culture on the playground. When I say trash, I mean we talk to each other. And we talk about how good we are, how we're going to beat somebody, or how we're going to just destroy them on the court. And there's a culture that's on the court, on the playground, that where people have this phrase where they say, game. Okay, and so let me explain this to you. If a team is getting close to winning a game and there's only one basket that's needed to win the game, sometimes a very confident player or a very confident person, as they are taking this last shot, before the shot even goes into the basket, as it's leaving their fingertips, they'll make a statement like this, game. And what they're saying is, I already know that this shot is going in and this game is over. And so if you look at it like this, this is kind of what Jesus was saying. He was saying, it's over with. It's done. It's finished. What's finished? I've defeated sin. I've defeated Satan. It's done. I've, I've offered the ultimate sacrifice for all sin. Game time over. It's finished. So this is not a word of defeat. This is a word of victory. This is a very confident statement of someone saying, it's a done deal. This money in the bank. This game is over with. The devil is defeated. Sin has been destroyed. Death has been rendered powerless. It's game time. Boy, that's a praise right there. And I'm telling you, that is so good that I want to just pat myself on the back for that praise God. That was good. It's not mine. That comes from the word of God. But thank God that Jesus was able to say, it's finished. It's over with. And that was forever. It's, you never have to contend with death. Again, you never have to contend with sin or its consequences. Again, Jesus took care of it when he said it right there on the cross. It's finished. You ought to praise God for that. Let's move on to the last saying, the seventh saying. It's found in Luke, the 23rd chapter and the 46th verse. Are you there? And the reason when Jesus cried out with a loud voice, he said, Father, into your hands, I commit my spirit. And he breathed his last breath. Man, this is most powerful. Probably one of the most powerful statements he made of all of the seven. You know what this lets us know? This lets us know that Jesus was in control. God was in control of Jesus's life. No one took it. 
Jesus had to give up the ghost. And this statement here is connected to the it is finished statement or finished statement because the Bible tells us, I believe in Mark, that during this time frame, right when Jesus said it's finished in the temple, the veil or the curtain that separates the holy place from the most holy place split right down the middle. That was symbolic because the most holy place was separated from the holy place and only the high priest could go in there once a year to offer a sacrifice for the sins of the people. He had to do it every year over and over. But there was a separation between the most holy place where God's presence was and where the holy place was, which means that people themselves could not go to God for their own forgiveness. It had to be a high priest. The veil separated them. The veil separated them from God, which was symbolic of we were separated from God. Somebody had to go to God for us and ask God, to bless us, to heal us, to forgive us. But when Jesus said it is finished, then the veil in the temple split right down the middle. There was an earthquake on the earth. And when Jesus saw the earthquake and he knew that the, that the veil had been split, he said it's finished. And he said, now I can give my spirit to the Lord. He said, now I can die. I wasn't going to offer my life before this happens. See, no man takes my life, Jesus said this, but I offer it up. And so this shows us the power of God. This shows us the power of God. God is saying to us, nobody can take my life, and I'm not giving up my life or giving up my spirit or committing it into the hands of God until my job is done. And so Jesus remained with his spirit in his body until he knew the job was done. And when he knew the job was done, he looked up and said, okay, God, it's time. I'm getting ready to commend my spirit or commit my spirit into your hands and to give my life into you. You're trustworthy. And as I get ready to close this out, what a beautiful and wonderful imagery and a wonderful lesson for us. We can trust God with our life and with everything in our heart. This is an encouraging word, especially for this time that we're experiencing right now. When we are worried about with COVID-19, and with the pestilence that's going across the land. We're worried about, man, what's going to happen with my family? What if I get sick? What will happen to me? We need to understand that your spirit came from God. And when it's time, it will go back to God. And even if it happens to be that God requires us to come to be home with him during this time process, we can look up to heaven just like Jesus did and say, Father, into your hands, I commit my spirit. And if it is time for me to go, God, I just pray that it's finished. And now I'm ready to give my spirit and my soul into your hands. I hope these seven last words, the expounding of them was a blessing to you. I hope they blessed your life. I hope you'll be able to revert back to them, listen to them, share them with someone and be blessed by it. And remember on Good Friday, Jesus stopped dying to communicate seven important messages to the church. Will you offer this prayer with me as we get ready to close our time together? Dear Lord, I thank you for Good Friday. I thank you for our Lord and Savior, Savior Jesus Christ who died on the cross for all of our sins. And on this day over 2,000 years ago, Jesus made the, a selfless, the great decision for us to give his life so that we might have eternal life. We were not connected. We were not friends with you. The Bible says that we were enmities or enemies against God in our natural state. But Jesus at one point became your enemy with all the sins of the world on him so that we could become your friends. Makes me think about that song. What a friend we have in Jesus. All our sins and griefs to bear. Lord, bless all of my brothers and sisters who are hearing this and hearing messages all across the country, all across the globe. Bless us to commemorate you, to love you, and to lift you up in this time. It's in your son, Jesus' name we pray. Amen. God bless you, my brothers and sisters. Be well. Sing with me.
Yeah. 